we had got into chapter 20 where uh, Jeremiah is uh, put into stocks where he is uh, uh, bound if you will and <clears throat> uh, this pasture uh, was uh, like one step below the high priest in other words this was a guy with a lot of authority in the uh, within within the law of Moses so uh, he uh, took Jeremiah he didn't like what Jeremiah said Jeremiah had been prophesying these things about what God was going to do and the fact that that people like Pasher and some of the others were taking God's people in the wrong direction so he had um, took Jeremiah and put him in stocks in, uh, in, as it says, in the high gate of Benjamin, which was by the house of the Lord. And then the very next day, verse 3, he got out of the stocks, and Jeremiah said, The Lord has not called your name Pashur, but this other long name, which basically means fear on every side, meaning that Pashur's existence from now on was going to be a terrible one. And, that, and that's exactly what was going to uh, happen to uh, him because he says in verse 4, I will make you a terror to yourself and to all your friends. They shall fall by the sword of their enemies and your eyes shall see it. I'll give all Judah into the hand of the king of Babylon and he shall carry them captive to Babylon and slay them with the sword. And moreover, I will deliver all the wealth of this city, all its produce and all its precious things, all the treasures of the kings of Judah. I will give into the hand of their enemies who will plunder them, seize them, and carry them to Babylon. And you, Pasher, and all who dwell in your house shall go into captivity. You shall go to Babylon, and there you shall die and be buried there, you and all your friends to whom you have prophesied lies. And so it all comes back to Pasher and those again in the priesthood who had taught something false. They had prophesied lies. And so all of these terrible things were going to happen to Pasher and his associates uh, because of that. And they would end up being taken captive and taken in Babylon and they would die in Babylon, which was like the worst thing to happen not not to die and be buried in your own land but to be but to die and be buried in a foreign land that was like one of the most horrible things to happen uh, to uh, an Israelite but that's what was going to happen to them and all the uh, the treasures you know all the gold and silver and all of that was going to be taken out of the temple and taken into captivity in Babylon and and all of these things that that he treasured were going to be gone and that was what was going to happen so <clears throat> we move on in the next couple of chapters we're going to see Jeremiah's very human side Jeremiah was probably the most sensitive <coughs> of all the Old Testament prophets that we have a record of and we're going to see in the next two chapters how Jeremiah goes like this. Up, way up, way down, way back up again, way back down again. I mean, it seems like it happens just that fast. And we're going to see that a lot in the next two chapters. So, <clears throat> it says, O Lord, <clears throat> this is Jeremiah talking, you induced me and I was persuaded or enticed you're stronger than I and have prevailed. I am in derision daily. Everyone mocks me. He, he was saying that people are ridiculing me, mocking me, making fun of me. Uh, all of these things. Uh, we start to see that Jeremiah is really down. Of course, he's just been in stocks for a day, you know, so he's, he's probably not in the greatest mood uh, and he says, God, you have prevailed because you're stronger than me. And again, everyone is mocking me and ridiculing me. For when I spoke, I cried out. I shouted violence and plunder because the word of the Lord was made to me a reproach and a derision daily. 
He says, everybody, you know, because of what I was saying. See, Jeremiah says, I was prophesying violence and plunder. But I was prophesying that, God, because you told me to say that. See, Jeremiah is trying to put some of this back onto God. God was the one that told him. Of course, Jeremiah is inspired. And, and God is the one that is telling him to do that. Now, Jeremiah is saying, because of all the bad news that I'm having to uh, proclaim, that's why I was put in stocks. That's why people are mocking me. That's why people are ridiculing me. Because of all the bad news. All of it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> he's almost saying that, God, you've kind of deceived me. Of course, God didn't deceive him, but he's kind of saying that, that, that you've deceived me. But if you go back all the way to like the first two chapters, one of the things God told Jeremiah was, I'm appointing you a prophet, but it's going to be ugly. That's what he told Jeremiah. It was going to be bad. Jeremiah, you need to get ready for it because it's going to be bad. So, Jeremiah, at least momentarily, is forgetting about what God had told him. And, and, and some years have passed by now, by the time we get to chapter 20. Uh, <clears throat> remember, this all started in like, what was it, 604, 605 B.C., something like that. And so a number of years have gone by, even though it's not, necessarily chronological but still several years have gone by so he's saying because of what you told me to tell people people are, are, are reproaching me and I'm a laughing stock and I'm being ridiculed over and over and over again people are doing this to me <clears throat> he says then I said I will not make mention of him nor speak any more in his name Jeremiah saying okay I've made a decision I'm not going to prophesy anymore. I'm not going to, God, I'm not going to say these things anymore because all it's getting me is ridicule and people are, you know, making fun of me and mocking me. So Jeremiah says, I'm not going to mention your name anymore. I'm not going to speak in your name anymore. Jeremiah says, I'm kind of tired of it. Well, then he said... <clears throat> But his word was in my heart like a burning fire shut up in my bones. I was weary of holding it back and I could not. So Jeremiah is really undergoing one of these crises where part of him wants to not say anything. Part of him wants to just shut up and go find a place by himself and not preach anymore or teach. He is. Right? <clears throat> In these two chapters especially, we see really his emotions. We really see his humanity in, the, in these couple of chapters here. And, and so part of Jeremiah wants to do that, but then there's another part in Jeremiah that says, but your word was in my heart like a burning fire, shut up in my bones. So Jeremiah is saying, even though I want to go and not say anything, I can't. It's just something inside me that's got to come out. Just has to come out. He, he couldn't not say anything. And we've all probably been in situations where it'd be nice if we couldn't say anything, but we have to say it. We have to say it. Because it's the right thing to do. And that's what Jeremiah is saying here. I don't want to say it because I know what's going to happen. I'm going to get more contempt, more ridicule, more mockery. But I've got to say it anyway because it, it's the right thing to do. It's what God wants me to do. So regardless of the consequences, Jeremiah is saying, I've got to do it. So he says, for I heard many mocking. Again, this is more the idea of people slandering him. Again, he's just telling the truth. That's all he's doing. For I heard many mocking, fear on every side. Report, they say, and we will report it. All my acquaintances watched for my stumbling, saying, Perhaps he can be induced, and we will prevail against him, and we will take our revenge on him. So, even his closest friends were turning on him. And he hadn't done a single thing wrong at all. He hadn't done anything wrong. 
He was merely speaking what God told him to speak. He was just speaking the Word of God, speaking the truth. But his associates, his acquaintances, his friends were all waiting for him to fall, to stumble. So they could do what? Take vengeance on him. See, they were watching his every move, you know, uh, constantly and wanting to take vengeance. Wanting to take vengeance. Because he wouldn't say that everything was sweet and like cotton candy. That's what they wanted to hear is that everything was grand and wonderful and God was going to protect them against the Babylonians and nothing was going to happen to Jerusalem or the temple. But Jeremiah couldn't say that because it wasn't the truth. So, verse 11, But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Now, Jeremiah is kind of back, headed to the top. You know, he's been down. Now he's starting to come back up. But the Lord is with me as a mighty, awesome one. Therefore my persecutors will stumble and will not prevail. They will be greatly ashamed, for they will not prosper. Their everlasting confusion will never be forgotten. But, O Lord of hosts, you who test the righteous and see the mind and heart, let me see your vengeance on them, for I have pleaded my cause before you. Now there seems to be a little more optimism in Jeremiah's outlook, a little brighter, a little a little more light at the end of the tunnel. He is recognizing the fact that God is the mightiest, most powerful of all. And so he's asking God, you take care of these people that are ridiculing me and mocking me and all of this. You, you take care of them. It says, you are the one that tests the righteous. You know that these people are, are just trying to uh, to uh, take vengeance on me and, and, and do what's wrong. So let me see your vengeance on them. Jeremiah says, let, let me see that you're taking vengeance on those who want to take vengeance on me. See, that's what Jeremiah is saying now. And he even says, sing to the Lord. Praise the Lord, for he has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. This was one of the big issues that a lot of the prophets had with God's people. Was that God's people were oppressing their own people. The rich was oppressing the poor. The powerful was oppressing those with no power. And so Jeremiah says, God has delivered the life of the poor from the hand of evildoers. And so that's what he is, you might say, bringing to his attention because of what the people had done. So cursed be the day in which I was born. Now he's back down. See how fast he is, up and down? He had just said, sing to the Lord and praise the Lord. Now cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed which my mother bore me. So now it's, he was at the top of the mountain. Now he's way back down the valley again. Uh, again, this, this shows you know, how human Jeremiah was, how sensitive Jeremiah was, how emotional Jeremiah was. God uses people like this. And, and that's what he's doing here. So, he said, Cursed be the day in which I was born. That's how bad he's feeling now. He just plunges all the way down into the depths of despair. It says, no one should have rejoiced when I was born if they would have known how bad things were going to be for me. So it says, let the man be cursed who brought news to my father saying, a male child has been born to you, making him very glad. It says, that man should be cursed who brought news to Jeremiah's father that Jeremiah was born because of what Jeremiah was undergoing. His life was going to be one of tragedy. And it was. A good part of Jeremiah's life, which extended over decades of, of him prophesying, a large part of that was a very difficult 
time of despair and, and agony and suffering, Jeremiah, for the most part, did not have a very good life. Uh, when you look at all the prophets during that time, the, the major prophets, Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, Daniel, they all, I mean, all of them had a much better life overall than Jeremiah did. Jeremiah definitely had the worst of those four by far. <clears throat> so he says, And let that man be like the cities which the Lord overthrew and did not relent. Let him hear the cry in the morning and the shouting at noon. Because he did not kill me from the womb, that my mother might have been my grave and her womb always enlarged with me. Why did I come forth from the womb to see labor and sorrow that my days should be consumed with shame? This is about as brutally honest as anybody could be. Jeremiah is saying, basically, I wish I hadn't been born. That's what he's saying. I, I wish I hadn't been born knowing that my life was going to be one of, of, of uh, sorrow and suffering. And, you know, he, he basically didn't have friends for most of his, or for a large part of his adult life from the time he started prophesying. Uh, he was put in stocks and, and he was put in chains. He was thrown in a dungeon. He was ex exiled to Egypt. and All of these things happened to him uh, and more during his life. And so he says, why did I even come forth from my mother's womb? So he is, he is just at the very bottom of despair. He's not going to stay there all the time. But he's there now. He's very, very much in despair. And, of course, he knows what's going to happen. He knows all the, the people, that, you know, the bloodshed and the, the, the heartache and the suffering that's going to happen in Jerusalem. And he knows the people that's going to go off into captivity. And he knows that, you know, all the gold and silver of the temple is going to be taken. So he knows all of these horrible things that's going to happen. He's already prophesied about them. So that just adds to the fact that, number one, nobody believes him. And that because nobody believes him, that he's having to suffer because he's just simply telling the truth. He's just telling people what God told him to tell them. And that's how chapter 20 ends. Like I said, it's, it's not the end of the story, but it, it, it is a sad one for Jeremiah right now. It, it's a very sad one. So, Lord willing, we'll start with chapter 21 next week and see how Jeremiah does.